Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. I'm your host, Mike Carrado. We've got a very special segment called On Assignment with photographers that had a chance to use the Z62 or Z72 for the first time, and we wanted to share their real-world experiences with you, let it hear from the mouths of those kids that were the first on their blocks to use some of the new technology. And as she uses Z62, we have with us today wildlife and conservation photographer Michelle Valberg from Canada. How are you doing, Michelle? I am awesome. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, it's just, again, it's, uh, it's been a crazy world for the last eight, nine months or so. Um, but, uh, you know, we're starting to move forward a little bit. We're starting to see the world open up again. Um, and uh, we're so happy to have you here today because I think it's so important that uh, the viewers who are tuning in have a chance to hear your experiences and not necessarily just mine or anyone else's. And you've had a chance to handle a Z6 II. And we're going to talk about that today from the assignment, how it comes in, the creative ideas, how you put it all together, how you plot out where you're going to go to photograph uh, wildlife. Uh, we'll talk about the lenses that you use and camera settings, all that kind of stuff. I think it's uh, really cool that people get to hear from you. So thank you for giving us your time today. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is tuning in that may not know who Michelle is, uh, just give everybody a little bit of background on your career uh, so we can get them up to speed, and then we'll take it away with the assignment. Okay, I have been a professional photographer for over 30 years so hard to imagine even saying that number. Um, I started my career in, in the studio and I still shoot in the studio, but primarily I'm working as a wildlife photographer. I'm a Nikon ambassador for Canada and I'm a Canadian geographic photographer in residence as well. So I, I am slightly obsessed with the natural world and, uh, and documenting nature and spreading the stories that we all need to hear and enlighten people on the beautiful wildlife um, that we have in this world. So I'm really, really lucky and fortunate to be able to do what I love every day. No, I love that too. And those of you tuning in, just so you know, we've got some Nikon tech sitting on the side waiting for questions. So in the chat box below, if you've got any questions about the camera system, the Z6 uh, II, and things that Michelle's saying, write in and our techs will answer the questions uh, as quickly as we can. But this is a, it's a really fun experience with you. Uh, but before we get on to your experiences with the Z6 II, talk about your conservation efforts and some of the things you're doing to create awareness about the earth, the environment, and the wildlife that you photograph. Well, I photograph a lot in Canada. I actually travel the world, but my primary focus over the last number of years has been Canada and the amazing species that we have here. And just before uh, picking up the Z6 II for the first time, I was actually on the BC coast with coastal wolves and, uh, and 16 hours a day, Michael, 16 hours a day, we spent time in a blind. We got up before the sun rose. We were walking the beach. We walked probably eight k's a day and uh, we sat in a blind and waited for these majestic, beautiful, very elusive creatures to appear. And uh, it was one of the hardest and most gratifying experiences that I had. And the adrenaline was incredible. And really it's to, it's to showcase uh, these animals and the threat to, to them in, in the world and, and how we can help protect them. So I look forward to sharing more of those stories and, uh, and, a, and a little documentary that I made as well. And it's beautiful. I, I'm going to brag a little bit about what I have at home is a collection of stamps that uh, have your wildlife photos on them uh, in, in one big uh, sheet. And I have it framed at home and I'm so thankful to have that. So thank you for sharing that with me. But you've done a lot of work and, and, and people check out Michelle Valberg. Just Google Michelle Valberg. Look at the Instagram page. Look at her social sites. And there's a lot of great stuff that you've done through the years. So we're thankful for you uh, for that. Now, you have been using mirrorless up to this point. It's no secret that you're a big part of the Z7, Z6 launch uh, when we did that uh, a while back. Uh, so you have experience with mirrorless. Is that all you're using? And what's your prime body right now uh, before the Z6 II, Z6 or Z7? Both, actually. I have three cameras that I typically shoot with on location. And when I went down to New York and I, the Z7 was revealed, I was so excited about the opportunities and quite honestly, Mike, I have touched my D850 once since and I picked it up and I put it back down. Like I have gone full on, full in with mirrorless since that time. Part of it was probably because of the, of the shift in, the, in your mind and, and how you work, you know, and, and you, I remember the first time I picked up the D850 and I was photographing dolphins. We were in a cruise in South America and, 
and I was shooting thinking I was shooting my exposure that, you know, I was thinking that I was shooting the EVF, you know, and I was like forced off under exposed <laughs> when I looked at it. So I went all in. I just said, that's it. This is the future. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to really be proficient at and really get to know this camera because there's so many options. And I think it's made me a better photographer for sure. And for all those people that are, you know, on the fence, not quite sure, thinking the camera's deli, there's so many aspects to mirrorless that, that people are kind of weary about. It's kind of like when we went into the digital world, right, from, from film and uh, a little skepticism, you know, not quite sure if they should jump in and, and uh, maybe a little afraid of the change or, uh, but honestly, I think everyone is going to be better photographers because of the opportunities we have with mirrorless. So I've been all in. I have two Z7s and, and a Z6 uh, that I work with primarily. No, I think that's phenomenal. And it's, it's, it's a great, important thing to understand, too, because I, too, have gone back to DSLR. And then all of a sudden, you're looking for exposure or functionality or the eye button to come up. And because with mirrorless, I tend to never take my face away from the camera. Even with playback, I can custom set buttons so I can see that. And interestingly enough, as a wildlife photographer, most ways say that, well, Z6 would be a prime camera. But like you, I photograph birds here, you know, down uh, in my area, in my neck of the woods. And the reality is the Z7 gives you a lot of versatility um, to, to work with a crop mode, to be at the same file size as the Z6. But then again, when it comes to low light, and I hope we talk about that during this segment, the Z6 certainly performs in low light um, with a lot more power and, um, and speed. So we'll talk about all of that. So um, talk a little bit about how you put your creative together in all of this. And obviously in wildlife, the creative is – you know, going to come probably within moments as, you know, you run into animals and decide you're going to stop to photograph. And we'll talk about that and the techniques you use in wildlife as well. But uh, from the Z6, let's get into the Z6 II now. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, how, uh, how you felt the first time you held the camera, your first impressions. Oh, well, I had just come back from BC. So literally, I got off the plane, I went home, and there was the Z6 II. So not a lot of information was given to us, right? And uh, I immediately thought, okay, my assignment was wildlife and I had so many days to work it. I also had so many other things going on, including in the studio. So I had to be very strategic with my time. So the first thing I did, I, I went up to the cottage. Um, my family was already there because I had been away. Um, and uh, I immediately went out at five o'clock in the morning on my kayak because I had to go where there was somewhere that I knew that there was a possibility of seeing something. Of course, wildlife is probably one of the most difficult assignments for this because you have to produce, you have to produce with a number of different objectives, but you have no control over anything. You have no control over the light, behavior, what you're gonna see, what you're gonna get. And as Ron McGill says, the only thing about animals uh, that are predictable is their unpredictability, right? Uh, so can everyone can relate to that in wildlife photography. So it was, it was the, the tremendous amount of stress, I have to say, just because I didn't know what I could get, especially coming into the fall season. You know, the migration had started, the animals were starting to change color. They were, everything was starting to change, you know, and I had come off an amazing summer of so much wildlife and so much activity that now I was like, oh, but I also had mist to work with. I had, you know, the cooling temperatures, I had the color changes. So immediately I went to my cottage and um, I didn't have much luck the first morning out in the Kyle. So I went back and I, I uh, knocked on, on, uh, on the door um, and woke up my husband and I said, okay, time, time now you have to take me out in the boat because we have to go to the loons. And the loons were further away from us. So I made him uh, take me out and spend time with this uh, mom and her two chicks, which were growing like, like mad. They were so big but still dependent on the mom. So she was still feeding them, which meant I had more opportunity to get a connective shot or that, um, you know, that between the mother and the, and the chicks, I had that opportunity and that's what I really wanted. Good, so we'll talk about those images. What are some of the things you first noticed about the Z6 II? Changes, oh. differences, autofocus? What, 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 did you, what did you find to be a bit different? Uh, uh, first of all, it was the 14 frames a second. Um, even though the 12 has, uh, or so the Z6 has 12 frames a second, I didn't think that two extra frames a second would really make a difference, and it did, absolutely did. Uh, 
I didn't know. I wasn't told how many frames a second I was I was holding. So I knew immediately that there was a there was a difference and, and certainly uh, more opportunity to catch capture the action and in the burst mode it was like whoa this is crazy um and the focus system and uh, immediately i saw that there was new animal eye detect um and i didn't know how uh, it was going to work with the birds um so i immediately went to animal detect as well i was shooting uh, initially with a 500 um or actually i went out first with a 70 to 200 s lens and uh, and I because the the loons were you know you're still at a distance away. I made uh, Scott take me back home, and I changed off to the 500. And I actually used the 500 with a two times extender as well. So mm -hmm. I was super impressed with the power of the focus system. Um, typically, I'm doing the autofocus uh, auto area. Uh, I do a lot of focus peaking as well with my mm -hmm. with my images. Um, love that aspect, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit more too. So, um, yeah, I think the focus, and I was in the, uh, good light, so I didn't have the ability first off to try the the ISO capability, but certainly the um, the quickness of the 14 frames a second made a difference for sure. No, that's great, and you know I always break it down. It's not 14 frames per second; it's one fourteenth of a second. I break it down to the fraction because when you think about that, that's just a minuscule you know moment in time. And as you know, with birds, wildlife, animal, the gesture is so in important to just the difference and the nuance between where a head is positioned or where a baby may be. Um, that's so, so critical. Yeah, especially in action. I mean, that and, you know, the spray of the water or the positioning of the head in that one fourteenth of a second, that can make all the difference between a good photograph and a great photograph. And in, in parallel, at the same time, while you were probably out shooting, I was on, at a lake in Stony Brook doing the same things. And. And those are the same things that kind of struck me right away was the acquisition, boom, was right there. And I was actually following, you talked about the change of colors and the seasons and changes within, you know, the animals, the birds, the wood ducks were growing. And so they were going from virtually no color in the males to purple, to green, to the colors forming themselves on their chests. And I happen to personally believe the wood duck is one of the most beautiful creatures on the planet next to the mandarin duck. Um, and uh, we're going to get to see some of those pictures now. So if you don't mind, let's... Uh, Let's just jump right in and we can talk about the experiences along the way and the things that you did. And I, I definitely want to hone in on the lens, the focal length, the settings that you're using. You've already mentioned frames per second, but what you're doing for color, what you're doing for exposure, all that kind of stuff. So take it away from here. Okay, so uh, I was on the larger boat, so uh, I didn't want to get too close. So I actually, this shot was with the 500 millimeter PF with the two times extender. Um, the, it, I was amazed that I got the red in the eye on this loon. Uh, as they're changing their plumage, their eyes get darker. So it was really hard to actually capture. So the light was a little bit higher that morning because I had already been out in my kayak and it was a little later in the morning. Um, so I was glad that I was able to, to get the red in the eye. Again, I was just really trying to create a reaction, a connection between the mom and the and the chick, the chick is changing colors. It's actually getting more beautiful. I think uh, mom is, you know, starting to molt around her, um, around her mouth area and stuff. So I, uh, that was my primary focus, just trying to create that emotion and that connection between the two. Uh, so I was, um, my ISO was probably around 640, I'm the believer, I'll take all the ISO that I can get. Um, with these cameras, the Z62, and I'll talk about the ISO in a later shot, but, you know, I knew I had a lot of room to move, and because I was in a boat, they were moving, I was moving, obviously shutter speed is critical, and uh, I like to keep it even with the in-camera st stabilization, you moving, they're moving, I wanted to make sure that I had uh, a good uh, flash shutter speed, probably at, at least at a thousand. And, and of course I'm at F11 with the, um, with the two times on the 500, but I love that combination. Um, I, you know, the results that I'm getting are, are pretty spectacular. And um, yeah, so I, she was feeding the, the, the chick was coming at her all the time for more food. And uh, the, the movement was fast and furious and, and the disconnect when they were disconnected, of course, um, making sure that my focus was locked on, on the mom or in position um, uh, really made a difference. And I, 
I do uh, a lot of focus peaking as, as I'm shooting an autofocus as well, just to make sure that my focus is exactly where I want it to be. So I think that, I, again, is that married between the manual and the autofocus in a way that I can control exactly where my focus is, especially when you have multiple moving subjects or, say, branches moving or anything that's happening a lot. Uh, when I have the two subjects, I want to make sure that the focus was on the right. That no, that's, a, that's incredible and so, so important. And anyone tuning in, just so you know, we've got texts uh, waiting. If you have any questions, go into the chat box below and uh, we'll answer those as quickly and efficiently as we possibly can. We are here with Michelle Valberg, uh, wildlife and conservation photographer from Canada. who got to use the Z6 II uh, probably before anybody else uh, in Canada in the wildlife world. And so this is really critical. And I want to jump on this. You mentioned... Um, you know, your focus techniques and using manual focus and using the stripes that light up within the camera. Um, I think that's so critical. And I found that when I'm photographing birds in brush, I'm always grabbing the manual ring and using that kind of assist system to, to just target, you know, the subject to get the best possible focus and sharpness. But uh, that, talk about that just a little bit more about that, that technique that you're using. Okay, so I was a manual shooter, like manual everything, manual focus for the longest time. Um, the guys at Nikon would just laugh at me, even for birds. Like, I just like the control. I mean, everybody works so differently. So there's no right and there's no wrong. And for me, it was just, I wanted the control. And if I was out of control and if I didn't catch it, then it was my fault, you know? And then when the Z7 uh, launch came out, then... I really had to learn the, the autofocus and trust it and, and work with it a lot more. There were some times I obviously went to autofocus, but primarily it was my choice to always stay manual. So the focus peaking is actually, you know, you take acquisition on autofocus and then um, with the focus peaking, you can have different colors. So red, white, and green, I believe. I only use the red from primarily in white if it's in darker situations, but um, is it green or black? Uh, uh, you know, you got me. And I think it's, I, I know it's definitely red and, um, and green, but yeah, uh, I, I use, I use the red most of the time. Yeah. The green uh, is there, but I use the red as well. So um, I'm able to kind of like fuse between the autofocus and the manual system and that I'm taking acquisition and then I'm just, I'm, I've got my hand on the manual ring, off focus ring, just fine tuning. And as I press the back focus button, I'm able to just kind of tweak it. And then those lines will show up on exactly what is in focus. Mm -hmm. Obviously with moving subjects, it's not always the easiest, but say you're photographing a bear and you've got, you know, the eyes and nose, and then the bear moves a little bit or you move a little bit. And then the focus goes to the nose. Eyes are out of focus. It ruins, it ruins the shot. And it's just fine, right? It's fine tuned, especially at five six, or even if you're shooting at two point eight, whatever it is. If you know, if you're if you've got a really really shallow depth of field, it can make all the difference. So this just kind of gives me the control back that I can just say, hey, listen, I'm just gonna just make sure that that eye is critical and in focus and stays in focus. So, so go ahead. Okay. Now I was gonna say, did you have anything else? I don't want to cut you off. You know, you. You're Michelle Valberg. You never cut off Michelle Valberg. <laughs> it's, the, it's the one thing I've learned from all of these kinds of conversations through this technology on a platform <laughs> is that, you know, it's easy to step on each other. But this is great. I think it's great information because a little bit of learning. There's so many features within these cameras that if you take advantage of them, they're definitely going to help your game. So I was going to take it to the emotional part where you say, like you said, the most predictable thing about wildlife is that it's unpredictable. So you're out there and you start making pictures like this of these loons. And I'm very jealous because I don't have loons. You know, I've got every kind of, you know, duck that's down here. And I've got, you know, the, the swans and the geese and all of that. Um, but uh, how do you feel now emotionally that all of a sudden you're starting to make pictures? Oh, how do I feel now? Like in this moment? Well, in the, moment, in the moment that you're shooting, like, you know, you said your fear was going out there and something's not there. Uh, now you got stuff like this in front of your camera. It's got to be rewarding. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to send it back to a man and Chris and say, hey, listen, look, look at what I got. Look at what I got. Um, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And I have a whole series where, where he's nipping at, at the loon's neck. And um, again, you just, I, I'm always... I'm obsessed and I always think I can do better and I can do more. And it's like a good golf shot. You know, you just know you can do it and you just want to keep going back and practicing. So 
my uh, my husband unfortunately had to spend the weekend taking me back and <laughs> but again like it was just you know was something gonna happen was this behavior gonna happen you know where the where the um the chicks are feeding on their own as well so they're off doing their thing which mom's over here you know there was no connection happening at some point so you know with wildlife photography we have to be incredibly patient and we have to keep going going at it and keep going back because every experience is so completely different so yeah i was super happy when uh, when i was able to at least have uh, have the loons and know that i nailed a few shots to to start yeah, i could imagine um, beautiful motion, beautiful energy. I love the, the behaviors of many of the ducks or birds that I photograph. What's going on here um, and what were your settings? So the, the loon chicks, this is the same scenario and uh, interesting as well, always looking for background, looking the way that the light's hitting the subject, always important to me. And again, you can't necessarily, you know, control any of this, especially when you're on the water. Um, but for me, it was just changing a little bit position and making this is more uh, of the background, you know, more muted, not as blue. Um, and I was hoping for the behavior. And this is the loon chick mimicking mom and uh, flapping their wings and, um, and just watching between the two of them. The mom would do it and that's what the next shot is. And then, and then the chick would, would mimic exactly what mom was doing. So um, again, positioning. Is it going to happen right in front of me? Is it going to happen when it's turned sideways? I mean, the loons and their flapping can can be beautiful anyway. And I love that it was just facing me. This was full frame. This was with the 500 with the two times extender again. I cropped off the, the wings a little bit. Um, but again, I chose it because of the motion. And it's it's about the wings being off of the, off of the frame and then bringing everybody into the primary part of the of the image, which is the head shaking and the and the water falling off. So again, fast shutter speed, ISO. It was a, it was bright, um, probably around 640-800. This is such a beautiful shot, and Michelle, you and I share the love of a two X converter, which I know a lot of people don't want to get into two X converters because now you're taking the five hundred f four, you're converting it to a thousand, which is a two stop loss. I found with 600 F4s or, you know, the 800, 5, 6, um, you know, that the 2X converter comes in real handy because I don't think you can ever have enough focal length with birds. And I know you share that. Uh, talk about how important a 2X converter is to you. I have never been a 2X converter kind of gal until this year. Uh, when I am able to handhold a 500 millimeter and make it a thousand millimeter and you're hand holding that, it can make a difference from getting a shot versus versus not. And also the disturbance of the animal. You're able to stay at a safe distance. You're not going to maybe spook it. You're able to spend more time with the animal as well. The clarity, it I, I find even at F11, obviously you need the, the right light source, um, but at the same time, an image coming up, I'll explain. I didn't have a chance to uh, change my, um, my lens and I was with the Z62 and at F11 and, um, and I was able to capture it. I actually adore shooting with this 500 millimeter with the two times extender, that is my go-to. But I'm also using it on the 800 two times, which was critical for when I was with the wolves as well because again, they're very elusive, they're at a distance, and I really wanted and needed the reach. And you know, the focus system, everything is working, and the, the, it's hard to believe the clarity that you're getting with a two times extender. I was always against them. Now I'm telling everybody, mm -hmm. look, I'm hand holding a thousand millimeters, and okay, this is the result. I mean, I have, I have the images to share. This is with a 500 millimeter PF with two times extender. Yeah, to me, every generation of Nikkor gets better, and the generation of long tellies we had come out with from the 600 to the 500 to the 400 all came out with a much lighter version, and especially for hand-holding and wildlife, but now you mentioned the 500 F4, and that, uh, uh, that's just, uh, or the 500 uh, 5.6, that's an incredible lens to be able to hand-hold, even when you're out there moving, and I don't want to understate the, the point you made before about the VR, because not only have five stops of VR in the body, it works in tandem with VR in the lens. So that gives you even more of a benefit when you're out there in these types of environments. And I love this behavior. And now I don't have loons by me. I've got mallards and other, you know, forms of ducks and, and wood ducks. But 
the behavior is I found that when you see their heads dive under a couple of times, right? Boom. Mm -hmm. And they wet their backs. Boom. They wet their backs. Then all of a sudden you wait, just wait. And then the wings start to go and the kick goes. And because there's new fresh water on their backs, boom, the water starts to fly. Is that what's happening with the loons as well? Yep, absolutely. Same, same. And, and again, having that 14 frames, being able to capture, um, you know, from the start to the finish of, of this behavior, it was, it was fantastic. The positioning of that head is so critical as well. Again, what I was saying, you know, you don't always have the, the you know, the opportunity to have uh, the loon facing you or sideways. But I also love looking at this and seeing the back and the feathers and how they all unfold in the patterns. Um, and just, you know, the straight up and down of, of the beak is what attracted me with this image for sure. And of course, the beautiful green water in the background. One of the things I noticed using the Z62 and Z72, and I want to have you address image quality just a little bit. I found, especially an image like this, there's some striking detail, sharpness, and a bit pop to this file. Did you feel the same experience and that, that little boost in image quality? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there was just the dynamic range seemed to even be better. Um, yeah, everything uh, looking through the viewfinder, the and and speaking of the viewfinder as well, <laughs> and that improvement, it's just it's it's almost three D ish. You're looking and you're seeing it's so crisp and so vibrant. It's uh, fantastic. No, it's a great point you make, and I don't think people understand that out there, but the engineers, when they built this, it's actually a little Nikkor lens. You know, there's a series of elements, you know, within the, uh, the viewfinder, and there's as much attention given to the critical accuracy of color and brightness within that viewfinder, and one of those things that didn't need much improvement from the Z6 or the Z7, and I found that to be phenomenal. And again, we talked about functionality. I've got my playback, uh, everything moving while I'm working to the camera, so I can stay... Uh, you know, pretty much uh, focused on my subject and, and mentally locked in. Um, and I find that a big benefit. I, I would assume that's the same for you. Yeah, you're absolutely way more time on the camera. And you're not mm -hmm. looking, you're not chimping, you can do a fast review. Um, and it's so accurate to what you're seeing that, you know, I'm not even I'm not even paying attention to histogram. I'm working my exposure as I'm going, obviously, in changing light, uh, especially in the early morning hours. Um, totally to your advantage because you can start to see your exposure change. You can start to manipulate your exposure to the exact moment, exact setting that you want. It's, it's phenomenal. It's like, why, you know, why I, I, that's what I think probably one of the biggest things, obviously that I going back to DSLR, I would completely miss. And that's why I picked it up and I looked and I was like, Oh, wait a second. I'm not getting the exposure. I'm, I'm thinking I'm seeing the exposure because I've just so mentally switched over to, to mirrorless. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. Beautiful picture. I love working with you and, and talking to you about your images because they hit so close to home for me. Um, moose <laughs> out in the field. What's happening here? So I was like, okay, gotta, gotta get out of the birds on the lake and go to somewhere I know that have moose. And it's a park close to me it's only about two and a half hours it's called Algonquin Park it's a magical place and uh you know the rut was starting and I knew that I had more opportunity I wanted big mammals too I just didn't want birds I wanted to uh I love moose I'm absolutely in love with moose so this um I was actually with Jacob from Nikon Canada he was doing some filming with me and we were driving down the road it was early morning and I had had my 500 with two times on from the night before. Uh, we were photographing birds and I hadn't changed it. And uh, I really didn't think I needed to because most often you're at a distance. So I thought, well, you know what? I'll just leave it um, as is. And I'll really test the low light if anything happens where, you know, I'm at F11, it's early morning. Let's, let's take this for the ride. This is the time to test the low light and the ISO capabilities. So, we're driving down and Jacob sees the legs in the bush and uh, he's like, Moose! So we pull over and uh, jump out of the car. And, you know, obviously you don't want to spook. You don't want to get close. You don't want to approach these animals. Staying close to the car. I had the, I had the one, I was really happy. I had the 1000 until she moved uh, closer to the, to the road to check us out. And uh, she was so beautiful. And it was our first experience that morning. And, I just went with it. I had the 500 with two times on. I had really low lights. So, Mike, I never, ever 
this is what blows me away about mirrorless. I was at 4,000 ISO. I could have crept up to 5,000 or 6,400, but I really wanted to stay around the, uh, around the 4,000 because I also wanted to test uh, how crisp I can get with, uh, or I can get with the uh, shutter speed. One sixtieth of a second. I'm hand holding a thousand. You're kidding. No, a thousand, a thousand millimeters. I'm hand holding four thousand ISO at one one sixtieth and of eleven. Like what? Not That's amazing. insane. Now, did you break away from auto auto area AF and use a more targeted focus uh, for the eyes here? And let me let me mention this real quick. Within the new system, not only do you have uh, uh, IAF for humans, you have now it's built in to have IAF for animals, so it works in both video and still. Now, humans and cats and dogs are profiled, not typically the wildlife. I know you mentioned before there was a bird you ran into that actually profiled that bird. It saw that bird's eyes. Not typical for moose or anything like that. So, what focus mode did you use here? Uh, I was, again, I was set up for the night before, but I really needed to use the focus peaking because of the branches and because mm -hmm. of the low light. I wanted to make sure that I was focused on, on the eye and the eyelash. I knew how critical it was. Um, so I was in the auto area, auto focus, and just, you know, using that focus peaking, again, it saved me, I think. If I was just lightly off, off of the nose, or if I had a, a branch that was coming in front, it would have had a hard time finding what it was. It was low light. It still focused really well in low light. That was the other aspect that I found. Uh, the focusing um, in low light situations in the Z62 was, it was also absolutely fantastic. So this one I definitely needed to override and just make sure that I was, uh, I was spot on with the, uh, yeah, no. But, oh my yeah. God, it's so beautiful. And then it was done. And I, you know what, I, I could have, Mike, I could have changed. I had the 70 to 200 right, right there in my car. Um, but I just went, no, I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay with this and, uh, and capture something. And sure enough, she went across the road, there was a huge truck and then she was, she was gone. Like it was just over in an instant. And we all know how quick things happen in wildlife. So I was really glad. Mm, I did. This is amazing. And those of you tuning in, um, just in case uh, you are just tuning in, uh, look at the chat box below. If you have any questions about what's going on, like what are the three colors for the camera? Since the Nikon guy couldn't answer that question when it comes to focus peaking, uh, ask questions. We're running out of time to have you chime in with questions, but we do have texts uh, waiting on the side uh, to answer these questions quickly and efficiently. Uh, this is beautiful. I, I, again, I'm, uh, listen, this is not an act. I'm kind of speechless. One sixtieth of a second at a thousand millimeters meters at 4,000 ISO. Um, really a great testament to, to the VR within the system. Um, but we keep moving down the road. Is this uh, later in the day? What's going on here? Uh, so this is later in the day. We were giving up. Um, we had searched everywhere all day, all day looking for the moose. And then we ended up uh, coming across down a path, um, a cow with a big, huge moose, uh, a, a bull <laughs> behind her. Um, it's rut. Uh, so he was he was paying attention to this female. She ended up going into the bush. He ended up leaving. We followed and then came out uh, on the other side and saw that he was there with this younger bull. Um, no confrontation, but man, that big bull moose was saying, "Don't even think about her. She's mine." Um, they had already, you know, got uh, the the tree limbs caught in their in their um, antlers and uh, anyway we had a little bit of time Jacob was with me on this as well and uh, just super cool to be able to be uh, in close encounter um, safely of course uh, with with these two bull and just to just to be able to capture this and I was like okay now I nailed my move okay good <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it it's amazing, and it shouldn't go understated that the safety factor here, the protective nature of a parent over a child in the wildlife, that moose will rush you <laughs> to get you out of an area. Um, I've seen videos like crazy. Um, so the safety that you mentioned is so, so critical, right? Yeah, and, and it was rut season, so that male was like not having anything to do with us having anything to do with that female. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was absolutely critical. Always, always important to stay your distance and to not put yourself in jeopardy or uh, the animal in jeopardy as well. So very, very important. So important. Oh, that, that was taken, sorry, with the 70 to 200 with the two times extender for the S. Which, which one, this one or the next one? That, this one and the next one. Where I oh, so, this, so now this is which combo? 
that the uh, 6 2 with the 70 to 200 with the two times extender, the new S. No, that's beautiful. I, in fact, I use that combination a lot. I think, um, you know, with the Z6 II, especially in the low light that you started off with where you need it, that's where the Z6 excels. And like you said, the 14 frames a second. But a lot of times I play on the Z7 II now with the crop factor to, you know, create a file about the size of a Z6 uh, II or Z6 and, and have that extra distance. So it's almost like there's a crop factor built in where you're retaining quality at a great quality file. But that's, that's good to know. So this is as well as with that 7200 and the 2X. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and again, on a kayak, um, one, of the, one of the hugest, um, I, well, the biggest, I guess, compliment that I that I found with the with the mirrorless is actually spending more time with the animal. The river otters. It, this was in Algonquin Park as well. Um, super, super timid, and to, uh, very rare for me to have ever seen them out of the water. It was a mom and a, and a pup. Uh, but being able to be stealth-like in the in the kayak, but also with the silent shutter. I, you know, the silent photography has meant more time with these animals for sure. I, and I, I wasn't listening to the sound of my shutter. I wasn't hearing it, I wasn't disturbing them. Um, so I think that is also as a wildlife photographer, if you're thinking about it, I think it gives you more time with the animals without the disturbance of the, of the sound of the shutter. So this was super cool too, lightweight, uh, being in the kayak, being versatile and being able to pull out as well because there were two of them, I was able to um, you know, have that varied. With the 500, I've been, that's been my go-to wildlife lens lately with the two times extender. So with that prime lens, you don't have that flexibility. So I quite liked having that opportunity to be able to vary my focal length as, as I went, especially with the two of them. And they started to separate a little bit. Yeah, I totally feel that. And, and with a 2X or without the 2X with 7200, again, his perfect example in the eyes around the whiskers, that pop I'm talking about, that is just, it, it just seems like a, a step up from anything I've seen before. And that's where, you know, again, I, I'm no scientist here, but there are color scientists that work within this camera. You've got dual processes working for you to enhance uh, the performance and image quality. There's so many things going on that are transparent to us. It makes me think of some co a conversation I had with Joe McNally about, yeah, there's so much built into here, why wouldn't you trust it? And then like you have, start to use your techniques, you know, like focus peaking um, for the brush or getting through the brush and, and, and then maintaining your focus modes. Um, it's incredible. And like you said, uh, people don't, no, misunderstand here. This is not a typical occurrence to have the sea otter pop up out of the water, as you said. Um, and uh, so uh, extraordinary shot, just, just a beautiful, beautiful moment. Uh, I believe this is a heron, um, maybe a tricolored heron. Where are you? What's going on here? And, and, and tell a little bit of the backstory about making this picture. So it's a green heron and it's uh, photographed in a small area, right actually in the middle of our city. Um, in Ottawa called Mud Lake. And, and again, it's just that, okay, I chose uh, Algonquin Park, my lake, and my city in Ottawa to, for this assignment. It was what my choices were. And, um, and then you have to go looking. And it's amazing what you can see when you actually go looking, you know, first thing in the morning, going out, uh, going into the middle of the city, you know, and I think so many of us just don't think of doing that. I brought a friend the other day just to feed the chickadees. You know, it's, it's just something so amazingly um, beautiful that happens, right, when you spend time with nature and these creatures. And I was the only one there. I was with the 70 to 200 again, but I switched off to the 500 because I saw this heron fly and I wasn't sure how close I was going to be able to get to it. So I walked through the bushes, walked through the mud, <laughs> It was a crazy, crazy moment. And I really didn't know uh, the beautiful morning light, how it was going to hit the bird until I was there. And, uh, and sure enough, the bouquet in the background, the light on, on the eye, um, you know, it was, just, it was just magic. And literally, I had maybe five frames that I pulled off and then, and then he was gone. But again, you know, just working my way through the, through the bushes, staying at a distance, being quiet, um, yeah, it just gives you more opportunity for sure. Oh, it's so exciting. This world of mirrorless and these new cameras. It's just, can you tell how excited I am? <laughs> no, listen, your, your passion, your passion's always been there from the day I met you. And um, <laughs> the day you, uh, in a most famous way, turned out the lights at CES while you were presenting uh, electronic show, no lights. That was great. But no, I feel you because the, the, here's a bird tip. I, I always say this, you know, don't, don't, 
you know, press the shutter until you see the light within the eyes of a bird because every subtle movement of the head, which is why focus is so critical, if they turn out of that light, that eye's not yellow, even just a little bit. But if they're turned into the light and the light's coming from the right direction, you're going to get that pop of color in the eyes, which you don't typically get when it's backlit or something, you know, another type of light direction. So I find that to be just brilliant. And then again, the beautiful colors, you know, in this heron, um, in the backdrop, it sort of fits perfectly. And as a wildlife photographer, that's got to be a, a pleasure to you to have that sort of perfect scenario. Well, yeah, I, and I really didn't expect it. That's the other thing. I was just climbing through the trees and the bushes trying to get some sort of angle. And then to come across that and see it, it was just like, oh, this is so, this is so awesome. I yeah, you mentioned, it, I'm sorry. It, sorry, it, ha it just happened so quickly, right? Right, and it always does, right? Because it, within a split second, that heron could be off somewhere else. You know, if it's going to be perched there for a little while, or it's just stopping for a moment and then taking off and, and just you know, so, so amazing. And where I was going to go was, okay, so you've used the Z6, now you're using Z6 II. Can you talk a little bit about familiarity and how important that is to you? Absolutely. And I didn't have any knowledge whatsoever about this camera. I picked it up and I went out. I did notice the viewfinder. I did notice the frames per second. Um, I noticed that the burst, I probably thought that there was more buffer room. Um, anyway, I uh, was absolutely astounded. And it was like, just picking up from it was like picking up the six or the seven um you know from the dslr it feels like a nikon it is a nikon it feels great in your hand um it's lightweight and it's and everything is familiar all the buttons everything was is right exactly where where i'd wanted to be i mean that's pretty awesome that you just pick up a camera you put a lens on you go out and you start shooting birds and you have success i mean that's that says a lot about nikon and i think that is what is so amazing that uh, you know, from this transition from DSLR to mirrorless, that it includes all your other lenses, all that investment that you've made, all those F lenses that you have, everything is transferable, everything works with the mirrorless system. And it just keeps getting better and better as you, as you uh, roll out the roadmap to your, to your new lenses. And it, it just continues to get exciting. So for me, being able to just go out in the field and everything feels like a Nikon is so critical as well. Yeah, you bring up a great point, too, because I, I think back to when you were part of the Z7 launch, we had three lenses and an adapter, which yeah. turned us into essentially over 300 lenses to start with the system. But more of the native lenses have come out. and We've got a wealth of lenses now with Zenicor, and it's just going to continue to grow and just get better, like you said. So I, I share your excitement and your passion. Yeah. One of my favorite birds, although I think it's been overtaken by the Blue Jay for me, um, just because of who visits in my backyard and my little backyard bird project. But talk about this shot and what you got going here. Beautiful. The same morning as the Blue Heron walking back and uh, saw this cardinal on the ground. Um, he picked up a seed and he jumped into the tree, positioned myself so I was able to have the, the green in the background. Fortunately, he stayed to eat the seed for a little bit. Um, molting juvenile uh, younger cardinal and uh, I, I've just never seen one look like this in the fall. I've, I don't know I guess I'm usually in the Arctic or far away places in the fall and I don't spend a lot of time photographing around my area and that was one of the greatest gifts as well with COVID and you know having to be focused primarily on my on my area and it wasn't just the lake and it wasn't just Algonquin but it was around my home and I see a lot of cardinals around here, but I've never seen a molting cardinal quite like this. So I thought he was pretty, pretty spectacular looking. I agree. And, uh, you know, your backyard is a bit different than mine. <laughs> you have an expansive landscape uh, with all kinds of foliage and, and beautiful places to go shoot. My backyard is literally a backyard in Levittown, New York. And I did the same thing. Only my backyard, it was the small birds, the sparrows, the blue jays, the, uh, the grackles, and the cardinals and it was a great learning experience for me too because as you mentioned before this is a, a bird you know growing up to be an adult and that's why it's not a fully red uh male at this point but to distinguish the difference between males and females is a tough thing too uh, but you learn a lot right that's part of the whole fun of this and the passion of it all but it's a beautiful moment and it's a very genuine moment um you know uh, these these birds love their little seeds or little parts of of, of certain uh flowers and uh, and just just so beautifully done. And now my favorite. I've been I've been waiting for this because, again, I, I think I've become a wood duck fanatic. Um, I want you to completely admit here in front of everybody tuning in that uh, it is a common fact that male ducks 
uh, are more colorful and more beautiful than female ducks. Um, score one for the males uh, in this regard, because um, it's not usually the way. But talk about the wood duck, where you are, focus modes, close out exposure. What were you doing here? Um, beautiful, beautiful image. I love the color in this. And then the balance, you know, the, the, to me, the eye of the wood duck, woo, always kind of the cool thing, too. Oh, totally. What's happening? Yeah. How is it possible that a male wood duck can be so beautiful? Seriously. How did the how did the females get so gypped out of this color? It's it's hard to even believe that they could have this kind of coloring. And I am obsessed with wood ducks as well. And I think if you've seen one, um, they're pretty spectacular, and you'll become one as well if you haven't seen one before. And I have been posting others as well on my on my Instagram. Um, but yeah, so I saw this wood duck, and there there wasn't a whole lot going on. It was early morning. They were kind of docile. Again, I'm on assignment. I wanted the color of the fall leaves in the water. That was primary. And then this guy came up and he just started to rest and preen a little bit and stand on one leg. And the other ducks were kind of floating around him. But I did have to move my position, right, to get, a, to get that framing exactly right and to get that color of the water in the background. So again, it was just working my EDF and, and, uh, and the exposure was changing a lot. The sun was, you know, going in and out. Um, positioning of the head, making a, sure that, you know, that red eye is intact, um, using that focus peaking again, just because of, um, of the other moving ducks. And I just wanted to make sure that that eye is so critical to be in, in focus. So I don't know, probably I would say 80% of the time I'm using focus peaking. Mm -hmm. However, with eye detect in the studio, this is my studio where I'm at, uh, when I'm shooting at 1.8, you know, with uh, human eye detect, it, it, it's like 99.9% .9 success rate at being on in focus. Like it's ridiculous. It's so unbelievable. So um, anyway, I just digressed off of the, off of this beautiful wood deck, but he was amazing, beautiful. And again, just, um, you know, the changing light, if you're out there first thing in the morning or even late day, being able to manipulate your exposure on the fly, watching how it reacts, um, how the light reacts to your animal, um, you know, again, that's just going to make us all better photographers. It has me anyway. No, I, th I, I think you, you sum it up so well. Again, can't thank you enough for these details because, you know, w where I'm photographing in this pond, usually the wood ducks are so skittish, right? I mean, just one quick move and they just dart away. And yet um, in this pond, because this is these uh, juveniles growing, the colors are changing. It's just phenomenal to watch this whole process. And every one of them seems to be a bit unique. Some with a little extra purple, some with a little extra green, some with line outlines. Um, the chest beautiful with nice dots. It's just a, a fabulous creature. So I'm glad you shared this one and uh, the one we will end on uh, right now. And let me bring you back. And I know to, you put that one in. And I wanted, I wanted to end with it. And I think you wanted to start with it. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's good that we ended with it because we're ending on uh, one of my favorite notes and uh, the reality that male ducks are more beautiful. Um, that's just a fact. Uh, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful creature. Uh, uh, but uh, Michelle, really, this great, great insight. Um, is there anything else you want to close out, like parting words about the Z6 too that you haven't mentioned at this point? I think we've covered a lot. I think we've covered a lot. Anyone, any, if you uh, have any questions or any impressions anyone wants to share with me, happy to as well. Um, I just can't wait to get it in my camera bag. I didn't have enough time with it. Honestly, I would have loved to do a little bit more work, obviously, in flight. I used subject tracking with that. Um, I did have some eagles. Uh, unfortunately, they did all their interaction in the sky with my kayak facing the wrong way. Um, I just didn't have a whole lot of time to spend, uh, unfortunately. So I look forward to adding this camera to my camera bag and trying the Z7 II as well. Like super excited about that. Um, yeah, if you're if you're questioning mirrorless uh, and you haven't made the move yet, I would highly recommend uh, moving in this direction because um, there are just so many aspects to the mirrorless that that just make you a better photographer and give you so many more opportunities. I mean, the DSLR system is, is fantastic, don't get me wrong, but you know, when, when we just keep seeing all these lenses roll out and these opportunities, like even having that two times extender with the 70 to 200, huge, like zero problems in focus, fast acquisitions, amazing detail. Um, 
it just it blows my mind. I just keep continuing to be blown out of the out of the out of the sky, out of the water with with all this opportunity and and it just is ignited as I think you can see in my passion. You know, it just gives us so much more opportunity and and you don't you know there's one last thing. I know you knew that I would probably have something else, but you said that you know where you live, your backyard is is all these you know from crows to blue jays to grackles. I mean, what a gift that is, and you don't have to go very far to find nature. And my sister lives in downtown Toronto, and she finds owls and she finds turtles, and I, you just have to go looking for it. And if you're looking at wanting to improve your wildlife photography, that's a perfect way to start. These small creatures are the hardest things to photograph, and if you can nail it and if you can practice with them it's going to make you a better photographer in the wildlife scene for sure that is those are words to live by because again if you're looking to de-stress photographing small birds is not the way to do that but you're right your skill set jumps up because they're so unpredictable they're so quick they're so small within inches four inches to seven inches long and to really be able to focus on them and, and capture them in a moment is very difficult but those are great words to to end with uh, thank you, Michelle, uh, for your time here. Again, your insight, your picture is so beautiful. Uh, but uh, being one of the first kids on the block to use a Z6 II, uh, it was great to hear the words from you and your experiences with the camera. So thank you for that. Thank you. Can't wait to try it again <laughs> and have it in my camera bag. <laughs> Does it make you jealous that I have one in my camera bag and I'm going to go out for the weekend? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have gone there. What are Those you of you tuning in. The duck too? <laughs> Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, uh, another segment with a photographer that has handled and used the Z6 II. Um, so you've got the insight from Michelle and what she's done in wildlife. We have more segments, so check out NikonUSA.com uh, and the Creator's Hour to see other interviews with photographers who use the Z6 II and Z7 II as we progress into the next generation of Z. Thank you guys for tuning in. For Mike Corrado, uh, for Nikon, I'm Mike Corrado. Uh, and please get out there, shoot pictures. We'd love to see them all. Everybody be safe.